Hi, welcome back. So let's continue our discussion of some of the mistakes I've seen people make over the years. And we're kind of counting down some of the ones that are maybe more deadly or dangerous for your financial situation. People mean very well when they offer to help you. But the next one is really a, a mistake that can get you in trouble. And it's looking for advice in all the wrong places. I don't know, that's a country song maybe. But anyway, looking for advice in all the wrong places. Um, Abigail. When Abigail's husband died, she was consoled by friends and family. Her adult sons flew in to help out with the funeral arrangements and help her kind of sort things out. After taking care of the personal matters, they turned their attention to her finances. And they reviewed what she had, what to do with uh, their father's investments, retirement accounts. Also, there was some life insurance money. So what to do with these things and how to also make up for lost Social Security, how to plan Abigail's financial future. So with the best of intentions and after consulting each other, the two sons advised their mother to do the following. Number one, liquidate the husband's IRA. It was $100,000, so liquidate that IRA and use that to pay off the $100,000 mortgage. Number two, take that life insurance policy and take advantage of the option available from the insurance company to draw a lifetime of income to help make up for what she had lost in reduced income otherwise. And before leaving town, the sons helped Abigail do the paperwork, get it all squared away, and send it in. Well, Abigail wisely decided just to double check. And so she asked her certified financial planner practitioner to review the plans that the, son had, the sons had put in place. And again, it's in motion. But she said, you know, while I'm waiting on this to get done, let me just run it by my certified financial planner. Well, the certified financial planner pointed out to Abigail that number one, liquidating the IRA all at once, this $100,000 IRA was gonna be treated as ordinary income. That means it gets stacked on top of all your other income in that tax year, and that resulted for Abigail having an extra $20,000 in taxes. Number two, while the life insurance being used to provide income, not a bad idea on the surface, she obviously needed the income, but number two, it left her without any real cash on hand, not only for emergencies, but guess what? To pay the tax bill. So very quickly, um, Abigail realized the calamity that was about to befall her. And so she asked the certified financial planner to put a halt to the well-intended but faulty plan that the sons had created. So as you might expect or already suspect, I was a financial planner that Abigail talked to, so I'm very familiar with what was going on. So what we did instead, what we talked about instead was, here's another way of doing this to get you to the same place, but maybe have some better tax consequences and put yourself in a better position. So number one, we took the life insurance money, which is tax free, and used that money to pay off the mortgage. So the mortgage was 100. We'll take 100 of the life insurance proceeds, pay off the mortgage, done. No tax bill on that. And there's $50,000 left over that can be held for emergencies or things that come up. Number two, we've got the IRA that the husband had. Instead of liquidating it, we can roll it over from the husband to the wife. That's a spousal rollover. And when you do that, guess what? No tax. It doesn't mean it's tax-free ultimately. There still will be a tax when Abigail pulls money out of the IRA, but just simply rolling it over, no taxation. So now we have no big $20,000 tax bill. We have uh, a $50,000 emergency fund, a mortgage that's paid off, and we have an IRA now that we recommended to Abigail that she set that up in something that made sense for her. So after looking at what her situation would be without her husband's income and based on what her needs would be specific to her plans and her situation and her survivorship and what she needed to do and what her obligations would be, 
Then we constructed a plan and what to do with that $100,000 IRA. And ultimately, we decided to use part of the money to have some longer-term growth for her because there's a need to address inflation long-term, but also use some of it with a fixed annuity to give her income. So she had a fixed annuity for part of the IRA, and the other part was no-load mutual funds. So when you put all that together, what you have is cash in the bank, you have growth potential with the investments, you have annuity for income, and no big tax bill. That makes a lot of sense to me. Now, there's more than one way to build a financial plan, but if you don't have a financial plan, a recent radio guest of mine said, you don't have a financial planner. Uh, so if you are trying to figure this out and you're in a survivorship scenario, man or woman, regardless of your situation, if you're trying to figure this out and you've experienced the loss of a loved one and there are funds that you will receive or that you need to figure out. Friends, family, wonderful support. Look to them for maybe being there to bounce ideas off of. Even though they are there and they're close to you, they may not be best positioned and knowledgeable enough. The sons in Abigail's case were well intending. They just didn't know. So lean on your family and your friends and if you want them involved, take them to a meeting with a professional advisor. I had a client not long ago hand deliver her friend who had just lost her husband to come in and meet with me. You know, protect your friends. And if you're the person who's lost a loved one, let your friends protect you. Let them hear what the advisor says. Let them be a second opinion about what they perceive from the advisor what they think about the advisor's recommendations, what their gut reaction is to the advisor. Have them help you pick an advisor if neither one of you know of any. Help can be a wonderful thing, but it's gotta be the right kind of help. You know, um, in my industry, there are rules on the security side against testimonials. You know, I cannot have a client um, stand up during a, a presentation I make and say, David's the best thing on the planet, and he's always given me these wonderful results. Not allowed to do that, and there's a good reason for it. It is, and can be, misleading. You know, there's a reason they say, at the bottom of all these financial things that you will see or hear about, prior performance is not necessarily indicative of future results, actual results can and will vary, you may incur a profit or loss. Somebody else's experience may not be yours. So be careful about relying on what people say has been their personal experience as it relates to performance. But you certainly want to lean on their experience with an advisor. Are they responsive? Are they um, willing to personalize, customize, and treat you as an individual and give you what you need, not what they're told or recommend by somebody else that work they work for or that provides a financial incentive for them to make a specific recommendation. Lean on your friends, get advice from a professional. And if you do those things, you'll plan stronger. <laughs>